So good afternoon. I'm delighted to be a moderator and also a panelist in this section called On Location and Entrepreneurship, Rethinking Real Estate Development in, in China. I'm Mercedes Delgado. I'm a senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management and also the research director and research scientist of the MIT Innovation Initiative Lab for Innovation Science and Policy. And in my work, I look at the role of location, in particular industry clusters, on innovation and entrepreneurship. So I'm delighted to, to have a great discussion with, the, with this team. And we have a Cixi Shen. She's an associate professor of real estate development and entrepreneurship at the at MIT Department of Urban Studies and planning uh, at the Center for Real Estate. She focuses on urban economic and uh, environmental economics with a special focus and expertise in China. She's also the faculty director of the China Future City Lab. Then we have uh, Billy over there. Uh, Billy Pan is the senior vice president of uh, Hong Kong Land Limited. He's responsible for asset management of all the commercial property portfolio of Hong Kong Land, and he has more than 17 years of expertise in this area. Then we have uh, Jay Yan over there. He's the co-founder and CEO of Nash Work. Nashwork is the largest co-working uh, space company in China, so we are delighted to have this panel. So let's get started, uh, Sishi, when you, when you are ready. Okay. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much, and uh, thank you for coming to our second session on, on China. So uh, I will spend like 15 minutes to present our research progress on this um, uh, economic geography of innovation and entrepreneurship in China. So the slides. Oh. Okay. So yeah, so just um, we have the China Future City Lab and we have uh, now 10 industry members for my lab. So my lab, uh, as I introduced in last session, two parts, research and education. For the education part, it's an entrepreneurship education program that we bring MIT staff teams to China to meet the demand there, and also China staff teams to here. So because of this part, the education part is about entrepreneurship, then I thought I also need to do some research on entrepreneurship. Actually, yeah, from after I came to MIT. So that's our today's topic. So we still, from the spatial perspective, because my research, my field is about urban economics, we always try to understand the spatial distribution of all kinds of activities. So in last session, we talked about the industrial parks and all the forms. In this session, I will focus on those uh, stops. So we started the power of the location, entrepreneurship, and the real estate development. So basically, the demand side is the startups. They need space. Supply side is like co-working space, accelerator, uh, incubator, the capital, the space that Zhang Jie and Billy will talk about. So that's a basic framework. And the Mercedes will provide some like international uh, experience and all those general framework. So this work is jointly by, uh, with uh, Du Rui, uh, postdoc associate uh, in our lab, and uh, Dong Lei from the, our lab and the Sensible City Lab. So uh, we, I will first introduce a little bit of, about our database, very exciting database, because you know it's very, very hard, actually, to collect such data on staffs, because there's no official s source of such data. But uh, uh, very luckily, we, we have the, our partnership with, uh, with uh, the largest I mean, data provider for these stops and the innovation space in China. We, we, we start to build up the database. And then we will uh, just introduce our model of the economic geography and entrepreneurship, both across city and within city. So to give you some, uh, I mean, the big picture, the China's entrepreneurship is rising. So from every evidence from other other uh, scholars and the media report. For example, is, um, in The Economist, they show us this, um, the uh, Ch Chinese venture capital that's just like ranks number one or number two in the, in the several fields, like the FinTech, 
and uh, it's number one. China already passed the United States and in others. So it's like, this is 2016. It's a flow. So it's a virtual reality and the robotics and the education and the driverless cars and the artificial intelligence is just uh, follow United States the number to the big, uh, the second biggest venture capital place. It's a big, it's a very good place. And also for the unicorns, it's like the number of the unicorns in, in here in the United States and China and all over the world, like China is the one third, United States is the one third, and all the, the other parts together, the, the last one third. So that's a booming, I mean, stop. Uh, economy, the, this um, innovation economy there. And also we, people talk about the AI. So the AI just um, uh, also grow very fast. If you see the growth rate already, the highest, I mean, is even higher than the United States, but of course, because of the very uh, low start point, I mean, in terms of the number of the companies still uh, a, a small portion of that in the United States, but still rank, rank number two. So all this evidence is just show China is a very, very big and very booming place for staffs and also a lot of capitals there. And uh, that's the whole picture of the whole China. That's not my research. And my research dive in to understand the spatial variation. Where are those the most entrepreneurial cities in China and within a city, where are those places with uh, all those uh, staffs and also the innovation spaces concentrated? So here is just a pic some like United States, you see the clusters, always is some um, companies, new firms and stuff, they, they, they concentrated in some certain places like the east, Eastern coast, or Western coast. That's a, that's a, this is the venture capital. So this is the accelerator programs, that's for the United States. And uh, we then built up this uh, MIT, our China Future City Lab, this unique database of entrepreneurship in China. So we partner with uh, C, C Total, that's the um, biggest um, data, uh, I mean, data provider. They collect all those stops and also stops, venture capital, and the innovation spaces, three layers of the data. So we have, now they are the data partner, they provide all those data to us, the micro level data. And we also get the form registration data for all the firms from 2000 to 2016 for all those um, standard uh, industry code and uh, GL code address. We GL code all those forms in the map. And we also are doing some in progress. So basically we collect all this very detailed data from all kinds of resources, build up the database. So we'll show you three maps. This one is uh, stops. So where are those stops? So you see that they are also concentrated like in this area, Beijing, and the Yangtze River Delta, and uh, around Shenzhen and Hong Kong. So the big three clusters, but also in Chengdu, Wuhan, and Xi'an, the big ones. So this is uh, where are those capital, venture capital, where are they? So this is uh, similar patterns. And third layer is the stops. Where are those stops? So, uh, uh, no, this is an innovation space. So this is the third one is the innovation space. So the pattern you can see, the innovation space is relatively spread out mm -hmm. compared to the stops and the capital. So stops and the capital more concentrated. Space more like sp spread out. So that's a basic, and if you, you put three layers together, you can see that it's um, all places, all cities, all provinces, they have the innovation spaces, but I mean, those forms and the capital in these big clusters. So, and then that, that's the, from the C total, all the three layers, and then from the form registration data, we can understand where are those new forms just emerge, the form birth. So we just gave some examples of the uh, several, several uh, industries, for example, these uh, all sectors, manufacturing, architecture and construction, and the wholesale. So those, um, those icons are just the unicorns in those cities, in this in that industry to give a sense. So you can always see the Shenzhen lead. I mean, in, in, all, in all, almost all the fields, Shenzhen is lead, I mean, the birth of the new forms. And, uh, but in, in, if you say that, like, we have another IT and the uh, technology and the education, so this, uh, and finance, always Shenzhen, always, I mean, a big jump, especially in, from 26, 2012, but because of Beijing, so expensive real estate market, if you look at the real estate, Beijing also, also ranks very high. So that's, um, that's the data we have. 
And then we map them all into the China's map for each city, all kinds of industries, then over time, spatial temporal variation, dynamics of the entrepreneurship in China, that's all the uh, new city, uh, new, new form birthes. You can see that the cluster just emerge here, Shanghai, Beijing, and Shenzhen here. So that's the data base we are now building. And then the, that's a fact, that's a big picture. And uh, also, as I mentioned in the last section, this top-down government policy also play an important role in this new wave of the uh, stops and the innovation space development. So, this, so we have this policy push since 2014. It's, like, it's a mass entrepreneurship and the innovation, so the federal policy tax, all the money that promote all these uh, stops and the innovation space industry. And this benefit fast growth efficiency, but the drawback is this a possible bubble, especially in some places, and the mislocation of resources. So you see here it's very interesting. For example, if you count the innovation spaces in Chinese cities, Beijing, more than 700, Shanghai, uh, Shenzhen also more than 700, and Hangzhou and Wuhan, and uh, like the other cities, but in New York, only 220 innovation spaces. That's from our MIT Rose Innovation Lab. So you see the, the very big difference if you mean compare a Beijing, but it's very achieved in you know, like three or four years, two or three years. So it's a huge boom there. And also some worry is that it's some real growth. It's a solid, with solid I mean, fundamentals or just a bubble because you have the cheap money and uh, the good policy, then every place just, just uh, provides such innovation space. So maybe it's just a bubble, and you see a lot of spaces just are vacant. So that's true. We went to some industrial parks, and uh, the industrial parks, and they also have these innovation spaces, and staff are welcome to come, and uh, we, we, we will charge nothing. You just stay here, we give you a lot of space, and, uh, and later, I mean, actually, no firms come, no staff come, then become vacant. So that's maybe a worry, so we, we, we want to look into. And then we run a very simple regression, try to understand if a spatial mismatch between the innovation spaces and the stops. So we rank, we rank those provinces and we see, okay, those part, those several provinces and the cities in those provinces is higher supply of spaces. It's more spaces than stops, because stops is the demand side. And for those places, it's less space, more stops compared, relatively more stops, but relatively uh, in, in under supply of the spaces. So that's, uh, that's very initial, but we try to understand. I mean, a spatial, spatial mis possible spatial mismatch. And with all these uh, big picture facts and data, we set up our, uh, our lab. Uh, now we are doing the modeling of this uh, entrepreneurship spatial variation. And we have the cross city and the within city, two versions of the model. So I will first introduce the cross city for different cities. The, what factors shape this um, economic geography? Then we have the models regression. Where we just um, uh, put all the data into the model. We try to understand. And these are the models. And then we have this, um, we find that those factors, the they just uh, they are at work for for the to explain the spatial variation disparity in these stops and stop I mean uh, for new forms, so we call it uh, like entrepreneurship capacity. We find that the uh, economic base and the uh, infrastructure they matter a lot. For example, the market potential, the market size, not only in this city but also near, nearby neighboring cities, and the industrial composition, parks. FDI, airport, all the transportation. And we also find our research institutions and human capital that matter a lot. I, say, I believe it's talk, also a talk from this perspective how human capital, because it's uh, innovation driven. So you will find that stops just very close to the universities and research institutions. And also because in China, a very unique feature is a spatial inequality. In, the, in those research institutions. So if you go to Beijing and Shanghai, many, many good universities, but if you go to like Zhengzhou and other cities, very few. So this disparity also result in a spatial, very a big variance, I mean, for those um, human capital and the research institutions. And all those stops will be, be very close to the human capital pool. 
And the capital also matter, but capital are mobile. So they can just go to every place. And culture and amenities also matter because we are from an urban planning perspective. So we are the urban planning department. So I'm also very interested in how this urban design and also urban amenity conception amenities also matter for these entrepreneurs. Our explanation is that because they, 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 they really value the face-to-face -face interactions. So for example, the restaurants and the coffee shops, if they just um, hand by hand. So if you find stops, there are a lot of restaurants. Coffee shops, because they, they go there, they interact, come up with new ideas, knowledge spill over. So that will just trigger more restaurant, coffee shop go there. So it's strengthen each other, become a very vibrant uh, environment. And also those high, high human capital people, they value quality of life. So if your city is so dirty, so polluted, that will drive out those I mean, uh, uh, high, highly, highly skilled people. And finally, policy also matter a lot, top down. So access to loans, the government efficiency, and this government push for the entrepreneurship. So for the, for the places with a very good policy, you will see a sort of booming of the stocks. So we, we use those factors, and we find this are really at work. And then we go into a city. So now we use Beijing as a case, but later we have data for all, kinds, all other cities. We can replicate this model to other cities. This is Beijing. This is a Zhongguancun IT center. And we map the spatial temporal dynamics of the new business formation in Beijing in the different years. years. You can see very clear sub, sub centers of those uh, newly established forms. If you are familiar with uh, Beijing, you know that um, some like very clear sub centers. So, for example, Zhongguancun is a very typical case about this, uh, all those IT related stops, just uh, emerge that. Because of, as a beginning, because the Zhongguancun is the location to Peking University, Tsinghua University, all those uh, research institutions. And uh, we also look at the innovation space. So this co-working accelerator incubator. So we run regressions. Basically, our conclusion is that, for example, restaurant, coffee shop, they matter because they create such a dynamic uh, environment. And uh, university research institution, they matter a lot. Industry park matter. And also cheap housing also matter. The story behind that is for these new entrepreneurs, they, they, they really are, they are not rich. And they don't want to spend in much, uh, a lot of money, I mean, to buy a very expensive housing. So for the places are access to those cheap, affordable rental housing, actually that's very important. And also the subway system also, if you, this location, you can use subway to access cheap housing and other clusters of other companies, that location will become very attractive. So that's just some like uh, animation of the, where those spaces, where those forms. So that's our within city study. And we are still working on several topics. For example, what's the implication of that to the real estate market? And uh, human capital, the role of human capital alumni. So the alum alumni from the famous universities, their network, consumption vibrancy, and also transnational entrepreneurship. The, and, and entrepreneurs from the United States, they go back to China and some to, from China to here, the international interactions. So that's our ongoing research. So thank you so much. Thank you. The, the next speaker will be Billy Pan, yeah? This uh, green one, the big green, yeah. Okay. So thank you. Uh, I'm Billy from Hong Kong Land Limited. Uh, my topic is the changing world of property developers uh, in relation to the location and entrepreneurship in China. So why is there a changing world actually is because uh, the changing need for the startups company, or to be specific, is their site selection criteria for setting up their, their business. For traditional companies like um, banking institute or uh, lawyers, accountants, that, that kind of service provider that drive the, that, that, that drove the uh, economic growth for the past decades, actually they tend to find a uh, location for their business close to their clients, close to their customers. But for the new startups company, that kind of sensitivity is relatively lower because they have plenty of other channels to reach their customers. And what they think are more important is whether they can find the talents, whether they can find the investors, which are the two main stream of plus for their startups for they to scale up their business. And then thirdly will be the local policy. 
whether the government can give, give them some incentive, tax uh, incentive, subsidies to help them to set up their, their startups, the fourth the customers. And the last one is property. The last one is the factors that we as real estate developer care most. So, so that's the demand side. From the supply side, I, actually we are, the real estate developer also are, are facing competition from other key market players. One is the government, and the other one is the technical giants. For the government, actually in, in China, in almost in every municipal uh, cities, they have their planning to set up to build large innovation park, industrial park, that provide plenty of space for those uh, new innovation companies, startups company. So it's like in Shanghai, Beijing, um, uh, Chongqing, Hangzhou, most of these governments have their own uh, office park, uh, innovation office park. And also for the technical giants like those big names that you, you, you all know, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, they, due to their bargaining power, they can buy cheap land from the, uh, from the government, not only to build their own office for their self-use, but also to build those innovation center, innovation office park to grow the startups company. So in view of these new competitions and also from the, uh, based on the, uh, uh, on the context of the size selection criteria from the demand side, actually to us, the property developer has any competitive edge over the governments and technical giants. So let's look at that. For the governments, of course, obviously they are very strong in government policy because simply they are the policy maker. So they can give all kinds of support to the, to, to, to the startups, just like what Sushi mentioned in, in his studies at the, the top-down approach. So this policy include how they attract and retain tenants, how they uh, attract investors, and, and very often, they not only attract investors, they act as an investor by using the government fund to set up some government net capital. Of course, they may not be that strong in customer, and may not be that strong in property in terms of buildings, specification, etc. For technical giants, they have huge talent pool by themselves. They have good reputation to attract tenants. And, and for those big names, actually they themselves are very big investors. You may all know that they actually invested a lot in those startups company or acquired some mature companies for, for, for all those big names like Tencent, like Alibaba. So they are neutral in local policy, and for customer, yes or no, because they can link up customer to those startups, but they themselves actually may be the competitors for those startups because they actually are monopoly for all kind of innovation industries. So, so for developers, we need a question mark on, all, on, the, on the above fourth. What we, what we uh, have competitive, competitive edge over the other tools may be we are more skillful in designing and building all sorts of properties. But that's obviously is not enough. So how, uh, so why, how the real estate developer to need to, to, to improve and that's why we have the changing role of the developer. So instead of really only build a property, actually we, we, we see the role to change, to build a community, community for attracting tenants. Firstly, we need to work with the governments to uh, see how we could retain and attract tenants. And in terms of building a development, actually we are now going to look at how to build and operate a community to retain the young talent. Not only to build an office, but we need to take care of the work, life, how to have fun, how to have their social, social gathering, et cetera, et cetera. So here we saw a project that we are planning in Wuhan. Actually, we dedicate quite a lot of areas to uh, build uh, 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 um, apartments that is uh, speci specifically designed for uh, the youngsters. And also in terms of the de development mix in the shopping center, in the uh, retail, just like what she just mentioned, restaurant, uh, cafe like Starbucks as something that, some ability that that actually can retain them to, to, to uh, 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 have their social life. And in addition, we, we, we also think about how they have, they, they, they have some fun and to play in the community. So, you know, in China, quite a lot of youngsters like to play mobile 
play games in the, at, at the mobile phone. So we create a so, so called, how do you say in English, in the electronic like, sports centers for them. So they can gather and play that kind of you know, electronic games together when, when they have their spare time. Secondly, on the investor, investor side, actually, uh, real estate developed by itself is capital intensive, and most of them are quite rich. <laughs> so um, you will see that actually quite a lot of Chinese investors, including uh, Chong Kong, Wang Qi, and including uh, Fu Sheng, who is the president of, of the previous section, actually they set up their own uh, uh, capital fund, uh, VC, or, or private capital. Uh, private equity to invest in startup or some uh, new innovation companies. On the third uh, criteria, local policy. Um, by, by its business nature, actually, real estate developer usually or have to form a very close working relationship with uh, the local governments from all levels. So uh, here we saw a project in Hangzhou that we are planning to work with the government. This, this day, uh, Three square kilometer, uh, a size of three square kilometers, and uh, when and we plan to work with the government to plan a science park there, and when when planning so actually for all those requirement for uh, tax incentive, government subsidies, uh, the streamlining of appro approval process and the potential for intellectual property rights etc. are building in the uh, framework cooperation agreement. Fourthly, customers. Actually, quite a lot of the uh, innovation, their ultimate goal is to improve people's quality, uh, life quality and to influence on uh, humans' lifestyle. So actually, real estate is one of the main application scenarios. Yesterday, I have, I have a very, very, very good discussion with, with some startups company, thanks to CG's introduction. Um, actually, they, they have very, Good, brilliant idea that can apply in, in, in real estate like smart home, VR application on design, environmental protection, uh, energy saving measures, how to use different kinds of uh, human signal sensor to detect the happiness of our shoppers so that to increase the retail sales of the shopping centers. All are very brilliant ideas. So actually real estate developer could consider to open up the business platform of themselves to help those startups company to really to startups to give them business. Lastly, property. So property is uh, traditionally what we what we as a real estate developer good at. So we need to provide full range products for the whole life cycle of the enterprise. It's relatively easy, meaning that you are a startup company, you need a small office space. Okay, then we decide a flexible small uh, office space for you. And when you grow up, you need a bigger space, and we have a bigger space. Um, you, when you grow up bigger, and we have a onboard office for you. So it's something that uh, a, a traditional uh, real estate developer can cater for. But of course, we need to list some, uh, add on some new elements for a small office. OK, uh, they may not have enough meeting room, training room, so we have some shared facility. But it's still easy, because we are good at, by definition, developers should be good at design build. What's more complicated is how to provide this space and service to cultivate a community. So um, rather than only buy the land, build the, build the office, and then this out to the tenants, actually we need to manage and operate the community. How to create events for them to gather together, to interact, so that ideas can inter interact with, uh, with each other. How to create, we call it a tenant club, so that uh, tenants from different offices can, can gather together to have sharing, to have their social, social life. Um, how the space can encourage uh, communication between different office blockchains. So um, this is what I think uh, really uh, a real estate developer has to learn and has to gradually transform. And this is what the expertise from Mr. Zhang, I think uh, he will have a very good uh, sharing with us afterwards. So to conclude, the changing role of the property developers, per, or, or, or perhaps I would say is really not a property developer, but a community builder and operator that will lead to interact and to link with all those uh, criteria, tenants, investor, local policy, customers, and the property, so that uh, really as a platform for all those startups companies. Thank you.
just do jump? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my my name is uh, Zhang Jian. <laughs> you may call me Will. Uh, Will Will Zhang. I am the uh, founder and CEO of Nashwork. Uh, actually, Nashwork is the largest uh, co-working space in China. Uh, we have around more than eight, uh, 8 million square feet uh, spaces in China, and now uh, more than 100,000 people are working in our spaces, uh, and more than 10,000 uh, companies we have served in the past uh, three years. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, a, it's a quite a pleasure for me to have a chance to make a speech here. Uh, I'm a little, a little bit nervous <laughs> because my English is not that good. Uh, I try my best to let me understood. Um, so today my uh, name is uh, from co-working space to uh, the infrastructure of innovation and uh, and prison uh, and prison ship. Uh, so uh, actually, we are doing what we call co-working industry, co-working space is for sp uh, small uh, startups and small enterprise. Uh, but when the startups and these enterprises, small enterprises, when they're growing up, it's actually uh, could be a be a industry. Uh, for example, Jindong, one of the largest uh, e-commerce company in China, uh, it is a very small companies in the past 10 years, in 10 years ago. Um, and actually, uh, we have uh, changed to Jindong's headquarters uh, to co-working space uh, uh, by Network. Uh, but nowadays, it's, Jindong is not only a, a company, uh, it uh, has been a whole industry, uh, uh, even several industries for e-commerce, uh, storage, and logistics, um, and uh, fintech and also high tech, so, and so on. So uh, when the small uh, startups are getting bigger and bigger, uh, in, even in, the, in a quick, more quick time, so it has been to our uh, industry. So we hope we can serve all such kind of uh, small companies to their be a large companies industry. And after that, we could be the uh, infrastructure. So, uh, first of all, we still want to make a, a evolution of workplace uh, because uh, in the ancient times, in China, it's a forbidden city, maybe the largest uh, co-working and co-living space for more than 10,000 people. Uh, also in Europe, uh, uh, in uh, industrial revolution uh, and in the latter half of 20th century, the working space style is changing. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what we nowadays can say is the most largest company in the world, Apple and Google, they are growing up from the garage, a small, very small garage, but nowadays they are all the biggest companies. Uh, also in China, the largest companies are not still state-owned companies. They are uh, what we call BAT, uh, like Baidu, uh, a startup from a very small studio, uh, a small uh, hotel in, in Beijing. Actually, their room number is very unlucky. It's 14, means going to die in China. <laughs> <laughs> but they still got very brilliant. brilliant. And uh, Alibaba, its early studio, we call Lakeview Garden. It's Ma Yun, the, uh, the, the <laughs> Ma Yun's house, actually. Uh, and nowadays, in Ali, uh, the most uh, uh, most powerful and most brilliant uh, new projects could be a, a startup in the Lakeview Garden. Uh, so also uh, Tencent, uh, the largest company, uh, is startup uh, start from a dance classroom. So all these companies, these uh, start from very small uh, uh, studios. But in, because in China, they're not such a, a good, uh, they're not garage for startups, so they need studios. Uh, that is also why later I will set a uh, network we provide super studio for the little startups. 
Um, so nowadays it's quite quite different because they have very brilliant uh, headquarters uh, in China. Uh, also, we see Google, Apple, Apple's new headquarters. We have just uh, go to there several days earlier in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's all get very brilliant. Uh, so it's changing. Uh, so we can see uh, two different trends. Uh, one is uh, uh, as a uh, we have mobile phone. Uh, one is the small com uh, the companies are getting smaller and smaller. More small companies are uh, uh, more and more. And another is people can work everywhere by their cell phone, by iPhone. So the uh, that is why the co-working is uh, coming up. I think that is a history. Uh, also around the world, more and more co-working spaces are existed. I think this is just a beginning. Uh, in the next uh, 10 or 20 years, uh, I think the, uh, in each working place, there, there should be a co-working space. Uh, it's, it could be 20% or more for the office market, no, no matter in office or in science park or industrial park or business park, such kind of things. Also, we have a unique uh, WeWork. Uh, it's 20 billion US dollars. Uh, people have different opinion of why it has such a high appraisal value. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know either. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, I think this is a trend. Uh, I don't know how to appraise, but I know that actually we have the need, we have the, uh, we have the amount, amount in this. Uh, also in China, uh, Premier League has uh, encouraged little enterprise to uh, growing up in China. Uh, but because in, uh, I think this is also quite important. Uh, uh, in China, in 1990s, many people they say around new companies jump into the sea, uh, so it's quite dangerous at that time. Uh, so, but many many mom and daddies uh, now they are they can more uh, familiar with that uh, that could encourage uh, uh, to have people to have their own business. Uh, so there are six more than uh, six million uh, companies each year newly registered in China. Uh, so it's just, I think also it's uh, uh, just a beginning. Uh, so uh, this is the background what we are doing, uh, doing now. Uh, so uh, we are in Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, Shenzhen, and Hangzhou. Uh, we hope we can in Silicon Valley and in Cambridge <laughs> soon we want to build our branches also. That because we think that there are more and more people in China and America, uh, they can have more communications. Uh, so we want to be the bridge. Uh, so this is just uh, some of our spaces that uh, uh, what we are doing in the past years is from the swimming pool to a, uh, to a uh, working space. Also, this is a headquarter of Jindong to a uh, working space. Uh, also, this is in a shopping center. Uh, the, this one is also we change another shopping center into a working place. Uh, it's more than uh, so now we have more than thirty thousand uh, square meters large uh, shopping centers into workplace. Um, also, we create some different super studio. I think because China and America have different ways of culture and the working style, so we put it into a, like we have boss rooms uh, and we have other uh, kind of, it's tea, tea time, not coffee time. We change something uh, by these native ways. Uh, so this is uh, what we are doing uh, nowadays. Uh, actually, we think uh, a company, once they grow up, he need different kind of, different kind of uh, working space. One is small, he need a station. Uh, like hot desk, but growing up, you need a, a co-working space. Um, even up, 30 people, they need super studio. When they're growing up, they need a flagship studio or wiki office building. When they have more than 500 people, they need a, a business park or industry park. So this is a circle for a company to grow up. When he grow up, he uh, have some incubator, uh, some new uh, enterprise that they need a new station. So by this circle, uh, we think we can have more. Uh, so this is what we do 
And uh, also, uh, this is uh, just the beginning. I think the enterprise service what is what we really doing nowadays because there are many space-based service and basic value-added service. We help the enterprise to save money, save time, and save energy. Uh, also, by the growth service, we have network, uh, college, and other club, leaders' clubs that help people to find money, find people, and to find results to do more business. Uh, and also, we have an app for them. Each people have their own account, and each company has his own account. Okay, sorry. Uh, so the fi finally, I think what we do is a space-based shared and enterprise service ecosystem. This is what we actually do. Uh, so that's the end. I think it's not easy for a hero tree to uh, get big in the past uh, 30 years, but finally he succeed. Uh, but his succeed is with himself and with ten, uh, 1,000 other plants. So we hope uh, it's a victory of not a tree, it's an ecosystem. We hope we can do this later. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm the moderator and panelist, so I get to ask them the hard questions, which is great, but I also get to uh, present some of my research that I have done for the US and hopefully draw implications for real estate development in China. Um, Industry clusters, they are everywhere. So three weeks ago, I was in Indianapolis. There we have a, an industry cluster of cars, an automotive, right? In Minneapolis, we have medical devices. In, uh, uh, for example, Krychar, New Zealand, we have a very resilient cluster on ICT that survived the earthquake, that was able to be resilient and come back in a few years. In China, we have many industry clusters. For example, here you probably recognize Alibaba headquarters, right? So e-commerce and distribution in Hanzhou. So they are everywhere. Now, what makes a cluster a good industry cluster? Well, you need a set of related industries rather than just one industry. So you don't want to have a sweater cluster. You want to have an apparel cluster, all right? You also need that those industries and those firms are related by many type of linkages. So it's not just talent. Today the panelists put a lot of emphasis on talent and capital. We also need the suppliers. We need the buyers. We also need the technology. We, ha we need the knowledge linkages. Those are also going to be important for an industry cluster to be entrepreneurial, to be innovative. We need many firms. And these firms are going to be clustered together. They're going to be big and small. They're going to be startups, but they're also going to be many incumbent firms. They're going to be foreign and domestic, and they cooperate and compete in these nearby spaces. What else do you need for a successful industry cluster? You need support institutions. They can be risk capital. We talk about the need of investment, universities. It's also innovation space, as we are discussing in this panel. And I like the name, maybe we need to call them innovation and entrepreneurship infrastructure, rather than just innovation spaces, right? As uh, the last speakers were mentioning. You probably recognize that picture. That is uh, Boston, a very important biopharma cluster. And later on, I'm going to explain to you how do we have, how do we get to develop this booming a biopharma and IT cluster here in Kendall Square. Now, despite globalization, despite internet, the world is not flat. Here you have a innovation. What we find, and I find in my research, is that innovation and production collocate in clusters in cities. In this map, you have the strong IT clusters in the US. The, region, the cities that are in green are those that have both a lot of innovation, but also they have a lot of production. No surprise, you have Silicon Valley, the San Jose, San Francisco cities, right? But also in Boston. And those regions with co-location of innovation and production account for more than 50% of all the IT patents in the US. So this co-location is very important. Also, what we learned through this example is that Cities are not isolated geographical units. 
cities need to be integrated with each other. If you look at the San Francisco, San Jose economic area, there are multiple cities there, and they are all highly specialized in IT. They're all part of the same IT cluster. So when you think about real estate development initiative, you need to think how to integrate cities, okay? Now, here you have the unique cluster composition of Boston. Every region has a unique cluster composition because every region, every city has some comparative advantages. No surprisingly, so the clusters that you see in color are the strong ones, they're related to each other. You have biopharma, you have medical devices, you have IT, you also have financial services, insurance services. So then when you think about innovation spaces, real development initiatives, think about what are the regional comparative advantage in your location that you can support, that you can build upon. Now, do clusters matter? Well, I have good news. They're everywhere, but they do matter. That's a lot of the research that I've been doing in the last decade, right, to show that if you have an industry and firms that are part of a strong regional cluster environment, they're going to grow faster in terms of jobs, in terms of innovation, in terms of uh, entrepreneurship, but also resilience to economic crisis. Now, it's very important that I'm using the word cluster environment. So it's not just about having a strong cluster like biopharmaceuticals in Boston. You also need the related clusters, the IT, the medical devices that we also have in Boston. You also need the ability to connect with neighboring regions. For example, in biopharma, Boston connects with Rhode Island, with the manufacturing that it happens in biopharmaceuticals in Providence, right? So, so you need a strong cluster environment. Now, since clusters matter, how do we support them? And to support them uh, at MIT, and in particular in the MIT REAP program, we emphasize that you need to take into account all the stakeholders, the entrepreneurs, the risk capital, the university, the government, the firms, the corporations. So let me give you an example. We are in Kendall Square in the Media Lab, right? But not so long ago, in 1970, it was called the Nowhere Square, right? There was nothing there. So how we go from the Nowhere Square to Kendall Square? And it's very important to realize that it takes time and it's also very important to think who are the catalysts. The catalysts are often universities and their research programs. For example, in 1970, Harvard and MIT take the leadership to collaborate to develop a new program, a health science education program that is going to start reorienting Kendall Square towards biopharma and medical devices. Then you have, of course, research institute, people, then you have the first spin-off of MIT in this area, Biogen, then firms come, and once you have density of firms, is when then you have an opportunity, I think, for all these innovation spaces to support the cluster that you have. But you first need the firms, you need the universities, the research institute, and then you have uh, innovation spaces. In this map, in pink, you have the innovation spaces. Many of them are very recent, five years old, 10 years old, but some of them are iconic. Like, the, uh, for example, in the map, you can see nearby Sloan uh, School of Management, the Cambridge Innovation Center, more a co-working space that is more than almost 20 years old, and it was a pioneer in thinking about innovation spaces, right? But you first need those, those firms. Now, so what are the implications? Uh, and then I'll ask some questions to the panelists. Is that then what can you do as a real estate developer, right, to improve industry clusters and to improve innovation ecosystem? And there are two things that you can do. The first one is a win-win. You are going to invest 
in innovation spaces that support the comparative advantage that you have in your location. You are going to support the industry clusters that you have in your city and build and strengthen those comparative advantage. That I call a win-win initiative. But then you have the failure initiative, the ones where you invest in a lot of innovation spaces, but you don't have the firms. Right? If you remember all the amazing research that Sishi was presenting us at the beginning, and, and I took the map from, from her work, there are mismatches. You have too much supply of these innovation spaces in some locations. So we need to think, how can these innovation spaces provide services tailored to the clusters that you have? So if you have biopharma, what kind of innovation spaces do I need to help biopharma firms? If I have aerospace firms, what kind of innovation space and infrastructure do I need to support um, those uh, innovation ecosystems? So my question for the, for the panel is as my advantage, right? I, the panel, I'm the moderator is, if you can give us examples of initiative that were win-win, but also initiative that they were challenging, that maybe they were a, a, initially they were a failure, and you learn some lessons from those initiatives. So what can, for example, co-working space, industrial parks, real estate development do to sustain and improve the comparative advantage of a location, and in doing so, improve entrepreneurship? So I throw them a big question. OK. And you can take it from there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your too. The cases because I only have statistics, so they too from the industry they have the examples cases. So, can you give us some examples based on your experience of successful and uh, um, maybe some failures as well? We can learn from the challenges and the failures. I think uh, uh, we need, uh, in, 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 in the context of China, I think uh, quite a lot of so called failure examples. Uh, uh, especially uh, some are done by, uh, I would say, uh, done by some uh, uh, perhaps unmature thoughts by the government. So uh, they tend to provide the space because they have land, they have the resources of land, so they can build whatever form of innovation park, etc. But actually, there's a mismatch, as, as explained by CGN. So there, there may be a mismatch. Uh, we, we put resources, we put effort to build those kinds of properties, but uh, whether how they can attract the talent, how they can attract the investor, there's a mislink between the two. And so, uh, so actually quite a, there, there's a phenom uh, uh, quite a common phenomenon, phenomenon in, in China is that actually quite a lot of those innovation office park actually are used by ordinary office user, okay. lots by innovation companies. Uh, because simply by the fact that those innovation companies would not want to go to there because they lack of talents, lack of the kind of investor that they need. So um, still, I think uh, uh, the, 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 the problem is that uh, the mismatch between the property itself, the land itself, and the uh, talent and the investor. So, so maybe I ask also the question too. So Nash work, right? What can they do to build the comparative advantage of a location? What are some less, lessons learned from your experience to create better innovation spaces? Uh, yes, uh, the, actually the uh, co-working uh, space and also called in China the space for mass innovation and, uh, and the prisonership. Uh, are booming, booming up uh, in the past uh, several years. So uh, uh, someone said it has bubbles. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> sure, I think there are bubbles in this kind of things because it's developed so fast. Uh, the many uh, spaces or many uh, uh, people they want to, uh, 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 including the government, they want to uh, accelerate the growth of the such kind of uh, industry, but uh, it is not easy. Uh, so uh, some pe many people, they want to 
they are not doing things for the uh, market. They are doing things for the uh, uh, government or doing things for the venture capitals. Uh, so some of them are uh, disappeared now, and some they are they want to be merged or uh, by the leading uh, companies. So I, I think this is a very normal. Uh, uh, procedure. So, so maybe I'll push a little bit of all the co-working space that you have in China, which one is your favorite one? Right? Uh, so you have many, so which one would you say you're the most proud of that co-working space? Uh, uh, yeah, now, now I have a very uh, a different one, like uh, our flagship stores in uh, uh, st uh, in China, uh, in stadium, uh, in national stadium, near national stadium, that is 14,000 uh, square meters. Uh, we have merged it into our uh, shopping center and co working space together. Uh, so that is a new, newly formed. Uh, you, yeah. Actually, we hope we can have a chance when you come to Beijing to have a visit to us. Yeah. <laughs> so can I give you an example here about this mismatch <laughs> story? So because my labs now have this FCIC entrepreneurship uh, program, so we bring MIT staffs to China, and we try to help them to find a place. I mean, e either co-working or accelerator or do some pilot project. And we talk to many city governments. For example, if we talk to, a, for example, uh, a inland city, I don't want to mention the name of the city, but I talk, we talk to the city and the industrial park. They say, oh, hey, come up come to our industrial park, we will give you like 300 uh, square meter space. We have enough space, just come. <laughs> if you, no, you don't need to pay anything, you just come and you register in my park, I will provide all the space by free. But, if, but it's very hard for us to find some like such free space in Beijing and Shanghai <laughs> for those stops. So, so that's, that's, that's an example of this mismatch. So, so many, I mean, so spaces over there, they just want to attract as many as many forms there, but it's, they, they have the difficulty in that. Maybe we have two minutes if we can take a question from the audience. Maybe someone, if someone wants to ask a question to the panel. If, over there, yes. Uh, yes, hi, thanks for the presentation. So um, I think we don't know, actually know that much about China here. And uh, obviously, there's a huge increase in scale. But So I want to go from uh, Cambridge's experience to China's experience, if I could. So I think of the Athenaeum Group, which provided uh, really inexpensive startup space in Kendall Square for 400 to 600 startup companies, uh, began probably 15, 20 years before Cambridge Innovation Center. Thank you. And, and it was more for the people who did not have money, did not have the academic connections, but really wanted to start something up. Kind of like the slides that were shown of Apple's start and of uh, Tencent and Alibaba and, and those. So, you know, people who just had a lot of entrepreneurship in their blood, but not much funding. And so I'm wondering, where those kinds of people get enough money to survive until they have a business that's working in China? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, many startups they don't have enough money. Uh, so <laughs> that is uh, also what uh, we can uh, do to help them, uh, because we actually we are also uh, the ecosystem of. Uh, startups in China. Man, we have very close co-relationships with uh, VCs and uh, co our, uh, our occupators and uh, accelerators. Uh, also, we can uh, help them to build a bridge to meet them. Uh, they can get money from such VCs or uh, other uh, things, uh, other kind of institutions. Uh, also, we can help them to uh, get some money from the uh, uh, governments, uh, they have some uh, 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 money for this, uh, but actually we uh, also uh, we help the best one, best uh, uh, startups uh, uh, by this way. Uh, but not everyone uh, they n they can get the money out, and they ne need to uh, raise the money uh, this way. Someone they need to raise money by their own way, I think. <laughs> so yes. 
So I think with that we conclude and we say thank you to the to the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.